Hello, everybody. How are you? I am so happy to be here with you on this beautiful Sunday. Um, before we get started, I'd like to ask you for two things. Um, one is on the chat box, let me know where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from Oakville, Canada. And secondly, if you haven't done so already, please um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, and that would be awesome. And hello, welcome. I am Patricia Hebue. And lately, rightly so, there's been a lot of talk and concerns about the, the sport, tennis in, in general, when it's going to come back, and in particular, tournaments, competition. And, you know, really, no one knows. Uh, no one knows how, when, how this pandemic is gonna end. Um, it's all speculations. Um, but one thing I do know for certain, it's not gonna be the same. T tennis will never be the same. Life will never be the same. And it's gonna be our new normal. And um, this is the way I see it. And that's what encouraged me about uh, six weeks ago to start the coaching webinar here, um, providing information. And very lucky, feel blessed to have the athletes and coaches with the elite mindset um, agreeing to come and share their, their insights on their tennis journey. So my view on, on tennis is this. The, the changes is going to come towards the collegiate tennis. Uh, once when there was one time, you know, at one time of a, a junior's life, when 17, 18, they come to that crossroad of, um, and the really good ones are normally thinking of, you know, going on the tour. But with this pandemic and no tournaments around, and that's going to change. And even when tennis co tournaments come back, this going to be very, very slim. So the choices for the college coaches to pick from are going to be humongous, which means the level, uh, it's going to be really high. And the, U the coaches use the UTR to to pick players to play for them. So that is where I decided six weeks ago, if you are players, if you have players, if you're players yourself who are young in your 13, 14, this is the time to really work on yourself, to really hone down what is it, reset, you know, rethink, reflect on how you want your level of play if collegiate tennis is where you want to go. And it's going to be a bottleneck. There's going to be more players to choose from and less scholarships available. Um, the scholarships may remain the same, but that depends on, on the, the, the football um, in colleges, which are the fundamental, the finance behind all these sports available at, in college. So I urge you as I bring in all these speakers or panelists coming to share their insights, please, please don't just listen, but really take heart to what they have to say and even better yet work on it so about our guest today and she probably does not need any introduction um, to the world she is known as the mother of andy and jamie murray who was the former number one player in singles and doubles i mean it's hard already as it is to to raise one tennis player but both of them and not judy not only is the cutting edge behind her son's success but she herself is such an incredible person and such a great influence in sports, in tennis. She's a huge advocate in women's coaches and huge advocate in that tennis should be everywhere. And she has received three honorary degrees as the most influential in sports in the UK. Um, I don't want to spoil with all the good things that she has done. She herself was a competitor and worked with national players on, in the Lawn Tennis Association. So please join me and welcome Judy Murray. Hello, Judy. I am going to ask to unmute. Hello. 
Hello, that's me unmuted. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing fine. Um, absolutely fine. We've got a beautiful day here in Scotland. Uh, we've had incredible weather through this lockdown, which is very, very unusual for us. We're so used to wind and rain and, and cold, and it's really quite uncanny how hot and non-rainy it's been. So, um, yeah, it's been good. So what, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your insights um, with the audience. And our audience is a combination of parents, um, tennis parents, parent coach, coaches, and players. So how have you been handling with this lockdown? You know, there's no tournament, there's no activities. Yeah, it's, um, well, the, the first few weeks of it, I actually quite enjoyed being grounded. Um, you know, I've got a really hectic life, um, you know, living in and out of suitcases, jumping on and off planes. It's been like that, you know, for many years. So actually spending extended periods of time at home is quite unusual. And I moved house at the end of November. Uh, so I actually had quite a lot of work to do in the house. So it, it gave me plenty of time to get a lot of the little jobs done I wanted to do around the house. And I did actually enjoy the shutdown, the chill out, the peace and quiet. Um, you know, but after a few weeks, you start to get a little bit, oh, I could really be doing something. But of course, there's not an awful lot you can do. But what I discovered was that, you know, I offered to do a Zoom with a local tennis academy that a coach friend of mine. And we had about, I think about 80 uh, parents, uh, parents and, and, and the kids. And I absolutely loved it. And I loved seeing the kids asking the questions and, being able to share experiences and ideas of things that they could do in lockdown to keep fit and busy and keep learning. And um, as a result of that going on social media, I started to get quite a lot of other requests from actually all over the world, including including yourself. And I've always been a big, it's always been a, a big thing to me to share the experiences that I've had with parents and female coaches, especially. Um, because when I was learning how to coach in Scotland, there was nobody for me to learn from. You know, we are very much a minority sport in Scotland, no infrastructure, and nobody had gone through that trying to develop players journey. And uh, so I kind of had to learn everything for myself. And I think that is why I'm so open to share basically with anybody who wants to listen. But I, I do think in general, all sports, not just tennis, need to help and support parents an awful lot more because we are an individual sport for the most part. And in any individual sport, the onus is very much on parents to make everything happen. Because I always used to say, you know, if my kids had gone into a team sport and been exceptional at team sports, they'd have been signed up by a club, they'd have been paid a wage and a bonus system, um, and they would have had all the training and the kit and the fixtures, everything would have been taken care of. And it would have been happy days, see you boys. But, you know, in an individual sport, we have to really create the opportunities and we have to be to make everything uh, happen. So I, I'm really a huge believer in creating more opportunities like this where you can share experiences and ideas about the journey. And every bit of the journey has completely different demands on you as a family, whether those are financial demands or social demands or organizational logistical demands. So uh, anyway, happy to share. Thank you so much. Um, I understand you were a player yourself. I, well, I was. Um, I was a decent player, I would say. Um, I think, you know, the backdrop of my tennis days was really that I learned to play with my parents. They were county level players, they were decent players and very big members of our local tennis club, which is just a small four court club in a small town. Um, but they taught me how to play and I, as I got better, I was able to play with the older kids at the club and then with the adults at the club. So I really learned how to play the game by playing the game. You know, back then, which is probably when I started out maybe about 50 years ago, um, coaching wasn't a thing. We just didn't have tennis coaches in Scotland, really. You might have somebody who would coach tennis for six or seven weeks in the summer, but they did other things the rest of the year because we had no indoor sports and bad weather. Tennis was just something you did for a couple of months in the summer, usually. So um, that was how I, that was kind of how I got started. But I, I was the Scottish number one for many years, which sounds quite good, but actually there hardly anybody played tennis in Scotland. So you, you kind of play the same people in every single tournament, and it, 
you can only beat what's in front of you, but it, it, it sounds more than it was. I think the, the, I won the British Hardcore Doubles women's title in 1981, and I played for Great Britain in the World Student Game. And that was kind of the sort of level that I, that I was. But from where I came from, it was probably quite a decent achievement to get that far with pretty much no support, which is another reason why probably why I've ended up doing what I'm doing, that there were no opportunities in my day. And when I became the Scottish National Coach in 1994 or 5, um, that was all I wanted to do, was create opportunities for the Scottish kids. Well, from what I read, you come from an athletic background. Um, your, your father was a football, as in soccer, in, in Canada and in the U.S., yeah. right? So you were feisty from what, you know, uh, from what I read. You were a feisty competitor. You did not want to just play for fun. Do you think that somehow was where the boys got their feistiness? And I know you helped them a lot with the tactics on the court. Yeah, I think um, my dad uh, was a was a footballer in the in the early 1950s. He played for a number of Scottish clubs. Um, he also played tennis and badminton at county level, and so did, so did my mum. But they were like two opposites. You know, my dad was this real tough competitor, hated losing, and my mum was one of these good shot, well done, hard luck, all this kind of stuff, which I never ever got. That I, you know, when I used played doubles with her from time to time and I said stop telling them good shot and she would say I'm just being sporting and I would say what's the point you're just encouraging them to do it again so I was very much my father's daughter and Andy is very like me in that respect you know hates losing probably more than he enjoys winning um Jamie very competitive also but not quite to that that level so I I, I blame my I blame my father for you know for sure but I think that you know, the boys becoming uh, great competitors and becoming great tacticians probably had a lot to do with the way that I learned to play tennis. So having never been coached, it was always about how do I make it difficult for the person on the other side of the net? And of course, the simplest thing when you're, when you're starting out is you make them run. You learn to hit the spaces. And then you start to have to analyze what are they good at, what are they not good at? What can they hurt me with? What could I hurt them with? If they hurt me, how can I get out of trouble? So I have three things, which is um, know how to cause trouble to an opponent, um, know how to get out of trouble if they put you in trouble, and know how to avoid trouble, which is basically understanding what they're good at and stop hitting it there. Don't let them do what they're good at. And I, I, I've stuck with those three things from way, way back. And they all came from a non uh a non-coachy thing. It was just a, that was how I learned. How do I make it difficult for you? Okay, if you make it difficult for me, how can I, how can I stay in this? How can I, so attack, defend, and stay, I, I suppose, just counter would be the, the other way maybe of looking at that. But both of the boys, I think that they got a lot out of doing many other sports when they were, when they were very young. And he was a very good footballer as well as tennis. And at 14, he was 14 and a half, maybe he had to make a decision between uh, tennis and football because they were kind of getting in the way of each other things happening at the same time you had to make a choice and Jamie was a very good golfer um, as well as a, a, a tennis player so they always had something something else you know through the teen years it was never just about just about the tennis and that was a great thing because I think if I look at they had different sets of friends that did the other sports with them which is also good so you know, Sandy's football team, it was, um, there were four of them in the same class at school that went up to, it was called Ochterard or Primrose, which is a very Scottish name for the little junior club. And the four parents of the four kids, we did a run up or a run back. They went up twice a week during the week. That was all I had to do. Um, and, you know, if it was a match on a Saturday, you know, you took the turn washing the kits and it cost you a pound a session. And the tennis cost me a fortune. And I was lucky that I could coach them for most of their, you know, most of their early, early junior years. Otherwise, I don't think I'd have been able to afford to pay for coaching and indoor courts, which we didn't have very many of when they were, when they were in their teens. But uh, luckily, four that we did have were very close to where we lived. Otherwise, there's no chance they would, they would have played tennis. They would have done something else. But they both became very good tacticians. And I think that was because of the way that they learned 
I think, and they did so much a variety of competitions, which I don't know what it's like in your country, but in, in my country now, when my kids were small, we didn't have red, orange, and green ball. We just had yellow ball. We just had full size sports. And that's where I think they had an advantage of having a, a, and they had parents and grandparents who would play with them all the time, but they had a mum who could put the ball wherever, wherever it needed to go to help them to, to learn to get out of trouble, cause trouble, or, you know, whatever. Um, so when they were eight and nine, I tell this story a lot. Um, when they were eight and nine, they were playing some under 10 competitions in Scotland and in England. And they were playing some under 12 competitions in Scotland at, at the same time. But they were also playing in the men's third team at our club with some of the guys who were in their 60s. So they learned not just how to play the game and how to handle the slice forehands and the lobs. and the, You know, because as people get older, they get sneakier and they don't play what you would call technically formed tennis because they've, you know, they've learned to play the game as opposed to how to hit the ball. And, but they learn to communicate with their elders as well. And nowadays, you know, what I see is that everything is pocketed and very programmed and very restrictive. And I think that the stimulation for them of the variety of competitions from singles and doubles and kids and older people, I think for sure was the thing that they really loved about tennis, the variety of the competition. And I don't see that variety anymore because you go and train in your age group, you compete in your age group. And it's the same, often the same kids, particularly if you're in a smallish local local area. And, you know, you compare that with the team sports where you've got a big gang of people around you and everything. So I think tennis needs to work much harder to have more team competition, more doubles competition, more recreational competition with fun formats, you know, the old handicap systems, the American tournaments. Um, I mean, we've just gone back to playing singles uh, just in the last couple of days at clubs. That's opened up but mostly it's singles you can play you can play doubles if it's with four family members or the same household and what it's done is it's made clubs reintroduce the ladder system and the box league which were kind of old-fashioned and put on the back burner and everybody suddenly going come and enter our box league and I thought wow this could be actually a really good thing for local and domestic tennis um, because it's making people think out of the box out of necessity Wow. You know, there, there is so much to learn here, Judy. What I, uh, what the takeaway for me, for what you just said is, you know, it seemed that the boys started out having fun competing, right? So they, they just love, you were saying earlier, you know, Andy hates to lose. So, you know, because he was put in competition with that, he had learned tactically how to outsmart his opponent and because wait did he play in he he started tennis in scotland and you were there with him and you were teaching the boys because that's my biggest thing is that it's not just all our, about power because these days everybody is you know it's like hard harder and hardest and then that thinking it's it's definitely out the window there's no thought there is no let me get you know if i'm in trouble let me you know turn it back around and put your opponent back in trouble. And um, also another thing I noticed is that um, the phones, you know, the resources, do you think that has a lot to do with kids not spending time in focusing? They're overcoached almost. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's too much coaching nowadays. And if you think about our sport, which is a very cerebral sport, for the most part you're out there on your own, different surfaces, different conditions, uh, different opponents every time, right hand, left hand, big, small, different styles of play. You have to be able to think for yourself and you have to be able to problem solve. And if you look at the world according to kids now, they have gadgets that solve all their problems for them. So do we as adults. You know, if I don't know something, it's, I, mean, I don't have Alexa, but I, you know, I will never forget babysitting my nieces who were maybe 12 or 13 at the time. And my sister-in-law said to me, They've got math homework to do. Can you make sure that they, they do that before they go to bed? And I went, yeah, okay, math's not my strong point. Anyway, um, we started doing the homework, and most of it was quite straightforward. And there was a couple of things I wasn't sure of, and I said, you might have to look that up somewhere. Um, and they, they and one of them said to me, it's okay, Auntie Judy. Um, I'll just ask Siri. And I said to her, oh, I said, is that one of your pals? 
and she looked at me with that kind of what planet do you live on and I had never heard of Siri no no idea and I thought how awful is this she picks up her phone asks a question and it gives the answer and I thought this is what we're up against in tennis so we have to as coaches and parents create environments where the kids can learn for themselves and if you look um at what goes on kids get programmed into activity from a young age and there's too much of it there needs to be much more opportunity for them to create their own practice sessions and think for themselves work things out for themselves their own scoring system their own rules you know even it up by making some kind of handicap you know you only get one serve or i start each game at 30 love you know whatever it is or you can't hit a backhand you can only hit a forehand so i've got to make you know i make you run more Ah, oh, gosh. Um, so yeah, I I see it as a as a as a huge challenge, but I also see an opportunity right now because of the lockdown that everybody wants to get out and wants to get exercising. And because certainly over here, tennis is one of the first sports to go back. We have got an opportunity to engage families together uh, in our sport and to get new people into it. And we also have this, not to say that, there, that everything is wrong with screens, it is the world that we have, and we have to understand the world according to screens, and this is, this is how kids have grown up, even if oldies like me didn't grow up with that. But we have to embrace it, and we have to use it for what it's good for, but we have to be aware of the pitfalls of it in terms of overdosing on it. So, um, I mean, it's been a godsend in the lockdown, all these Zooms and Instagram Lives, and things where we can stay connected, we can keep learning, we can share. Uh, so it has been great, but you know, at the end of the day, when you get out in the course, it's just you, the bat, the ball, the opponent, and the conditions. And that's what we have to prepare kids for, and we mustn't lose sight of that, that it's the human thing. Yeah, yeah. Out there, there's nothing a screen to help you. Yeah, for sure. So when the boys started tennis, um, when did you sort of notice at what age were they, where were they that you noticed like, you know what, th th there's going to be a bright future in the, in the tennis journey. Yeah, I get, asked, I get asked that a lot. And I think, you know, at a, at a young age, you know, at sort of seven and eight, they were really very, very good for their age. Um, but, you know, I'm sensible and common, common sense is a big thing for me. But, you know, I just wanted them to enjoy sport. I had no idea that, of course, you, you don't have any idea where they might go with it and and to, to be honest sometimes they're still it, it, when it really hits me what they've done the enormity of what they've done is when I go back to our old club in Dunblane you know a little four court club artificial grass cracking little clubhouse real community club and I see the pictures of them on the wall with all the other kids from their era you know and whether they're having pizza or playing table tennis or it's the little school team or whatever it is and that's when it hits me that they both became world number ones and they won grand slams against this backdrop of this little village club in a country that had no track record or history of success in tennis. So, um, but I think that when they were both uh, under 12, Jamie went to the Orange Bowl one year uh, in Miami and made the final, lost to somebody from Korea in three sets, uh, had the most fantastic adventure, like just the best time went as part of a, a group that was uh, two boys, two girls, and two captains. And I was looking after the girls, which was great because the two boys that went were both Scottish. This, part, this is part of a GB team because uh, you can't play for Scotland at tennis. You, you, it, you know, we're, we're a Great Britain sport. Um, and I, I was asked as a female coach to go with the girls. And it was great because the two boys were Jamie Baker, Jamie Murray. Um, and so they were kids that I'd worked with, obviously, since they were probably, well, Jamie forever and Jamie Baker, so he was about seven. He went on to make about 150 in the world and played Davis Cup. But for me, I'd never been to America. I, I saw more courts at one venue in America that we had in our entire region. I was like, what is this? It's like another world. I mean, where am I? It was, just blew me away, the whole thing. And this massive tournament, you know, 128 qualifiers, 128 main draw kids everywhere and it was wonderful anyway jenny gets the final loses in the final comes home with his little trophy and this wonderful experience that he's had tells it all to andy and andy gets the chance to go next year and he wins it which means he's one of the best 
of, of his age, probably around the world. But you know, not everybody can play Orange Bowl. Not everybody's got the opportunity to travel or the money. So I'm like, okay, look, he's really good. There's some great kids here from all over the world. But I think that's when it got a wee bit scary for me because up to that point, although I was the national coach, I didn't really, well, I didn't have any experience. I learned how to coach because of the kids at the club that I worked at were getting good, not my own kids, the older kids. Um, because I started as a volunteer when Jamie and Andy were sort of toddling. And uh, I just started on two hours a week helping out. And I wasn't a coach. Um, I'd been a sales rep when uh, when I had the kids. And when Andy was born, I couldn't go back to work because it involved far too much traveling. So my job went, the car went. And uh, I thought, oh, gosh, I need to do something to get out the house for a few hours during the week. And so I went over and volunteered at the tennis club when my mom could look after the boys. So that was how I got into, got into coaching and worked my way through qualifications and things like that and ended up with a national coach job mainly because nobody else wanted it. So if you think about Scotland, a, a, a country with, like literally when I took that job, there were no indoor courts, no infrastructure, no world-class coaches, no world-class program, not, not even a decent class program. Um, but if, if you haven't got any indoor courts and it's terrible weather like we have, nobody aspires to be a tennis player to just play in the summer. And nobody aspires to be a great coach because you just coach in the summer, you do something else in the winter. So really nobody wanted that job because there was nothing really to work with. Never going to attract somebody from another, another country. Um, so I took that job and I started with 20 kids uh, that I felt had the most potential. And I had to start small because I had a very £25,000 salary. I had a £90,000 budget for the whole country. So everything from the seven-year-olds to seniors to book courts with to employ other coaches with. I had no staff. It was just me and a bucket of balls and this budget and a bit of a block booking at four indoor courts, which were the only ones in the country, which opened at the back end of 1994. And um, that was how I, how I started with those 20 kids. But out of those 20 kids, uh, we got four Davis Cup players and a Fed Cup player. We got top 50 WCA, Andy Jamie, Jamie Baker, Colin Fleming made top 30 ATP doubles. And we also got a number of really good coaches out of it. We started a performance coach development program. We've never had anything like that in Scotland before. And out of that, in time, we got Leon Smith, who's our Davis Cup captain and head of men's tennis at the LCA. He's been in that role for probably about 11 years now. And he started with me when he was 20, uh, head of disability tennis at the LCA, also one of, one of the girls that, that started with me. So we created quite a lot out of the cottage industry because when I started that job, I started with a small number of players and I started with the parents. I brought the parents in to help me because I didn't have staff. I didn't have money to pay people. Uh, we didn't have, you know, coaches of any level in Scotland. And I thought, right, who wants things to happen more for their kids than anybody else? The parents. So I had them run, running matches, running uh, fun competitions, making sandwiches, putting other kids up overnight, doing uh, trips, shaving, driving and so forth. And we became a cottage industry. And it, it, if I was going to do it again, which I wouldn't know because I'm too old and I know how much energy it takes, I don't have that anymore. Um, I would do the same thing again. I would, because on your own, you can only achieve so much. But if you get everybody working together, you can make great things happen. And I see too much in tennis now where parents are almost like parents competing with each other. You know, the parents are. The, the kids are competing with each other, but the parents see little so-and-so down the road, the, you know, the, the pecking order, the, the, the peer groups, etc. And you don't see that. Actually, you know, we all need to use each other and see it all as a, a unit against the rest of the world rather than me against you and I'm not speaking to you and I never hit with you because you're in my age group and, you know, you're, you're a competitor. So I think, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's always been about fun creating fun environments, finding like-minded people to work with, training up anybody who would like to be included. And as I say, for parents was, it was a big, big thing for me. But that was, that was how I kind of started my coaching journey was as a volunteer. And everything I learned at the club, I actually took into the national role. And in lots of ways, I think that we were successful nationally was because we, had, we only had a small amount of money, a small group of people, and we had to, out of necessity, work together and we had to make the money go a long way by everybody 
mucking in. Um, yeah, and I would I would go back and do it exactly the same way. And I do hope the lockdown makes, you know, we're all in it together thing, makes people appreciate more of what's on their doorstep and the value of everybody and everything that, that they actually have. Well, I, I, you definitely nail it on the head, Judy, because that is the bulk of what I do now is to really bring together the parents, the players, and the coaches. Um, not, I feel that not only are players competing against other players while their kids are competing other you know, kids, but the coaches among themselves are also competing against, against each other. And I feel like they lose sight of the big picture I know what tennis is supposed to mean because there's there's a lot of good things that come from from tennis. You know, it's not just achieving or getting that W. Um, I would say from you know from what I've learned from you is that you still are a huge advocate. You still do that these days. I mean, you go around the country and you still educate. You have this great you know parents education um and you know you are a huge advocate in um encouraging female coaches coming forward yeah yeah there's um yeah the two things that i've been most involved in since i came away from the top end of the game which was i made a conscious decision to do that in 2016 um i uh, stopped uh, being fed cup captain and I just figured that I could have much more long-term effect on tennis um, by going back to the grassroots and sharing everything that I'd kind of learned over all of the all of the years. And I, in in Scotland, for me, it's about opening the game up and taking it into rural and disadvantaged areas, places where you might not expect to find it and where you wouldn't find money to pay for coaching. And I do that with my Judy Murray Foundation, very imaginatively named. Um, and uh, basically what we do is we go into rural disadvantaged areas and we build workforces. So we train people to deliver starter coaching and starter competitions in whatever space they have available. You know, whether it's a school gym, a village hall, school playground. If they have tennis courts, great, but many of these areas, they, they don't. But, you know, tennis is such a big thing in Scotland now because of Andy and Jamie. And loads of kids want to try it because they've got heroes and whatever. So for me, I was thinking, right, okay, instead of going around and doing loads of clinics for kids, we can have much bigger long-term effect if we invest in the adults in the community who actually want to do this, because they will make it happen for the kids. So we invest in them. So we, we never go in for a one-off hit, because a one-off hit has an immediate impact, but nothing long-term. We, we stay in a, in a project area for three years. And we invest in the we invest in the people, and we network the area. So we we network the primary schools, the secondary schools, the youth clubs. Um, basically, if there's a tennis club or if there's another sports club, we train up football coaches to deliver tennis as a, as an extra that, that they can do. So we basically work with whoever is there. We try and identify like-minded charities in those areas that we can kind of buddy up with, so that we're not reinventing the the wheel anywhere. And I absolutely love it. So that is really all about growing the game and taking, giving the opportunity to people to play who wouldn't norm, normally get it. And the other part of it, of course, is um, growing the girls' side of the game. More women and girls playing and staying in tennis. And I believe a big part of that is growing the female workforce. And when I say workforce, I don't just mean coaches. I mean people who can administer, run competitions, run fun days, be secretaries at the club if that's what they run the cafes all this stuff that the parents did at you know at my club take photos social media whatever it is you know bring them all in what would you, what could you do what would you like to do how much time have you got you know and you just start to build your army um but for me we have about 20 percent of our coaches in the uk were, were women but we had an entry level this was probably 2017 i did this research 20, maybe no maybe before that but it was while I was doing Fed Cup, maybe 2014-15, four times as many boys coming into tennis as girls at entry level. So basically tennis is not fun enough or stimulating enough. The environment isn't fun enough. It's a difficult sport compared to some. It's not a team sport. Girls like being with their friends. Um, so that was when I created the Miss Hits program, which is an entry, start, fun starter uh, program for girls age five to eight. And it had two aims. One, of course, was to create a, 
a, a fun kind of tennis party environment that developed the skills for the kids through these six animated characters, face, forehand, bella, backhand, etc. But the other thing was to encourage older juniors, mums, club members, teachers to get involved in starter delivery because it's a non-technical course. Basically what it does is it establishes a group of friends because it's all girls. So you create a group of friends because they're all coming each week. And at that age, kids don't care if you're any good at it or, or if, you, if you're good at it or not. They just want to be with their friends. So we have these animated characters, we have cuddly toys, we have music, we have dancing, but that's all pl placed around the skill building activity. So this is about understanding the world according to girls and creating an environment in which little girls can thrive. Create a friendship group, develop the coordination skills you need to play tennis and learn a bit about tennis through the animated characters. And then they go into the mini tennis program with a group of friends. Far more chance of retaining them because they understand better what they're going to be asked to do. They can do it because they're better coordinated because of Miss Hit. And they've got their pals around them. Whereas, you know, if you're a girl and you start off in a, a group of eight and it's six boys and two girls, good luck retaining the girls. But, you know, the other side of it was that it would be something that was easy to attract women into delivering because it's little children, it's non-threatening, it's non-technical, you don't have to have played tennis. You just need to be able to organise and communicate and be enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So um, we've, had a, we've had a lot of success with that. It was really it was me and my best friend that, that created it because there was a need and uh, we've absolutely loved it. We've got an online course now, which, you know, we've got people all over the world who've done the online courses because we, we can't be everywhere. But it, it's, you know, it, it's been a great thing. And, and I work with the WTA as one of their community ambassadors. And so they take me to some of their major events around the world. And I do the community engagement around some of those events. And I love that because, you know, the community engagement is all about um, building workforces for the most part. So, so it, uh, like, like the last place that I was at with them was um, Auckland. And I went way out, Maori, Samoans. They spoke to me, and there was one course that I did where there was three different languages and English. And they had interpreters and everything. It was fascinating to me. But they'd never had tennis. It was a way out in the sticks. And so I do two hours with the coaches, and then I do an hour with a class. So, so they bring kids in or teens in or adults in and I show them how to do and how to be in that hour. You know, how to communicate, how to organise, how to be in charge of the class, but with a smile on your face. And in the first two hours, I'm showing them all these activities, what to do and why it leads to a skill you need for tennis. Um, so although that is not entirely aimed at female coaches, we get a lot of female coaches and it's good for me to do it because as a hopefully a female role model coach, you basically think to the ladies, you can do this. Because if you only ever see guys in those positions, why would they think that this is something that I could do? So it's a big thing for me, I think, that understanding that if you can see it, you can be it. And in all the years that I was learning how to coach, and I had to travel a lot overseas to overseas conferences and workshops to learn because there was nobody to learn from in Scotland. In those years that I was doing that, I never once saw a female coach present anything, ever. Occasionally, um, a nutritionist maybe. You'll see a little bit more now, a little bit more on the sports science side than one or two coaches. But back then, nobody, and it really hit me that every time I went to one of those things, I was so much in the minority as a female coach. And that, you know, that can be a, an uncomfortable place to be. You know, we all know that. So I think that the more things that we can do that bring uh, like-minded female coaches together, you tend to not find egos among female coaches. You find much more willingness to network and share. Um, and I think there's a real strength that can come from having all women coach qualifications, all women CPDs as options. I'm not saying they have to be all like that, but you know, I can't tell you them. I mean, the last the last qualification I did, it was in 1995, just before I got the National Coach Role, and probably why I got the National Coach Role. So there was 20 of us on it. It was a year-long course. Everything was in England, which is, if you didn't know, is a long way from Scotland. So it was more time to travel, ex extra expense for me. My kids were small. It was a massive investment of time for me, it was a, and it was, a, it was quite a big risk, really. 
so still just a volunteer in our local club and our local district. Um, but there was 18 men of, on it and two women. I was the only one from Scotland um, of the 20. I was the only one who was a, a part-time coach. Everybody else was full-time in a big club somewhere. And there were a lot of heavyweight male, male ex-players there. And I spent a year like really hating it. I hated it and I got through it. Um, I got through it because I was clever, not because I was a good coach who could do all the projects and everything, could write things up easy. It didn't make me a good coach. It gave me a lot of information to experiment with. But I had to go out and find a way to experiment with it, apply it practically, and again, learn for myself. So I think a lot of what happened to me as a female coach trying to learn to get better and having no support network um, and understanding that these qualifications are really information based and not formation based because and I had nobody to go back and say right can I come and watch you work can I come and see how you would do this it just wasn't anybody so I think my experiences I mean we're all products of our environment I'm absolutely convinced that all my experiences have led me to do what I do now particularly as it relates to female coaches I can't tell you the number of zoom type things like this that I've done in so many different countries through the lockdown that have come from uh, come from women. I did one with Ireland the other week, Australia, New Zealand, um, Switzerland. But I'm very, very happy to do it because I hope it encourages more people to kind of step up, show up, speak up, all, all of these things that we need to do if we want to get somewhere. We've got to develop a thick skin and a brass neck and we've got to have bounce back ability. You know, if somebody tells you to get lost, just keep coming back and you know, make a nuisance of yourself, be prepared to, to, to do that because most of the key decision makers in sport um, are, are men, you know. So we have to show the way according to, according to women. And if you can find a gang of people or even a buddy at the club to, to do things with, whether that's coaching or running a competition, much more fun to do things with somebody at your side. I, I hardly ever work on my own anymore. I nearly always have somebody somebody with me. It means I can cater for bigger numbers, but it's much less stressful, more fun. You know, um, I was so impressed by the speed of your response to my emails. And that goes back to like a couple of years ago when you were helping me with a project. Um, you know, I, that is an encouragement because obviously, you know, you, you're a world figure, you know, and then I reach out to you and I can't say the same to other, um, you know, players or coaches as well. And that's the one part that I really, really wish that more female coaches, players, you know, they just come around more and support each other. Um, the one thing that uh, really strikes home with me, Judy, are two words from you, uh, role model. You know, I'm sure your feistiness, your, com your, your passion in, in tennis, somehow tra got transferred into the boys when they were young, right? And now you are role models for the, the women coaches and for female players coming out. And that is something that I've always believed. Don't just talk. You got to walk the talk. Yeah. Yeah, you're so right. You, 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 you know, actions speak louder. It's what I always say. And it's one of the, I think it's why... When I do these workshops um, for parents or teachers or coaches, I'm trying to sell them tennis, and I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to sell tennis to, to women. You 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 know you can do tennis, and if you're a teacher in the school and you've got 30 kids in a class and you've only got one badminton size hall court hall, here's how you do it: balloons, beanbags, shuffling squares. Here's how to work in twos or to work in fours, small spaces, all of this kind of stuff. I've i kind of perfected that over the years by realizing that when I went into schools, teachers were saying, no, I, I couldn't possibly deliver tennis. I've got 30 kids in the class and all they see is 30 kids, 30 rackets, 30 balls, and they see accident and emergency and blood and health and safety and all that sort of stuff. And so I've developed all this stuff over the years that it doesn't really matter who you put in front of me or how many, so long as I've got equipment, uh, I can just go, yeah, I know how to do that. And that's the benefit of, I suppose, being older and having done it for many, many times. I don't, I don't panic. But we should teach people how to teach big numbers because that makes our, our sport 
more sociable and more affordable, you know, instead of this one-on-one -on -one coaching or one-on three or four uh, coaching. And also, you know, everything that we do breaks down the skills that you need to be able to play tennis. And if you look at the way of the world, like we did when we started talking about the, the influence of screens and sitting down and kids are less coordinated than ever before when they come into sports because of that. And we are often having to develop those basic physical skills before we can get them to hit a ball. So if we start kids off who are uncoordinated with a racket, a ball and a net and some lines, it's just not going to happen. So actually doing 30 kids on a court with control the racket head with a beanbag on it to you and I trap it, I'm learning to handle the racket, I'm learning to control the racket head, I'm learning to hit in a rainbow shape, I'm making the ball go to you, I'm learning to cooperate and communicate. These are all skills that you need for tennis. And you, you start with the balloons and the beanbags and the chiffon squares and you move on to the ball. So I've, uh, I've developed so many different programs for making tennis more fun, more doable but to develop the skills that you need to be able to play it because kids are less resilient than ever before now too. So if they come into something and they go, it's too difficult, I can't do it, they'll go and find something else because we are competing with so many other things for their, for their time. So I think this is all about understanding the world in which we now live. What's the competition out there? What are they doing? And I think that tennis has to work harder than it's ever worked before to get people in and to keep them in. And it's so often the keeping them in is the fun part. It's the social side of, you know, what goes on at a club for adults, you know, the pizza nights, the coffee and cakes, the, the Prosecco and pancakes, or, you know, whatever it is, somebody has to organize that side and that the tennis has to be inclusive and have lots of big number activities. So I think the, and that knocks back to the way that we educate coaches. What do we need to educate coaches to do within clubs? to stimulate an environment that makes our sport right up there where we want it, want it to be. And we've got a unique opportunity just now. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but here, you know, tennis, golf, bowling, and fishing are the four sports that have been able to go back. So if we see that as an opportunity for tennis, so let's get families in and when, when we're allowed to have bigger numbers and be ready to embrace it all and create a fun environment and, you know, if you keep a family in, of course, the kids have somebody to play with. Um, if it becomes something that they all do as a family, far more chance of keeping them. Quite right. And, and especially these days, you know, with, with the, during the pandemic, it makes, you know, who knows how tennis is going to come back. So I just really foresee that it's going to be done more locally. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And again, I see that as being a big opportunity, I think internationally i see that they're still trying with us open and french open and everything that i read about it i'm fascinated with all the different scenarios that they're trying and i completely understand why they're trying and, and it's it's absolutely the right thing to do but it just sounds like everybody's at different stages every country's at a different different stage and i do think there'll be an awful lot of players fans officials media who will not want to travel until there's a vaccine and, and, and therefore, I think it's a massive opportunity to go, right, let's just sort our own stuff out. Let's get great competitions going on in clubs and encourage clubs within the local area to into club matches, into club tournaments. Um, let's bring all the American tournaments back, the, the box leads and the ladders, all, all of these kind of things. But I think it is an opportunity to invest in the domestic side of the game. And if you've got your big name players around and they are willing to give something back to the game, and I wish more of them gave back to the game willingly, um, kind of almost feels like there's an awful lot of them that won't move unless you show them the money. Yeah. Um, and that kills me because I think, you know, look at the sport that gave you so much and somebody created that opportunity for you. Give a bit back um, because you can use the big names as the role models in the profile to encourage others to to come in so i hope that uh, i hope that the top players will will step up a bit and, uh, and help out that I, yeah i agree local domestic right like the game great yeah uh, so i have a question um from a young player for you judy actually it's a two-part questions 
Um, if uh, it, it's uh, if you ever had doubts about Andy and Jamie become successful, and if boys had doubts how they how they did uh, with that, and it's from uh, Mihalo. I always find these questions quite uh, quite difficult to answer because. I don't know the person who's answering, asking the question. So, I, and, and I think that to be able to help somebody to overcome doubt, uh, lack of self-confidence uh, or lack of confidence, lack of, lack of self-esteem, whatever it is, you really need to know them very well as a person. And if they relate to tennis, you need to understand where they're at with their tennis, what they're good at, what they're not so good at. What is it that's giving you the doubts? Is it uh, is it lack of fitness? Is it um, your peer group have moved away from you? You know, I would need to know an awful lot more to be sure that I could answer you uh, directly. But I think that one of the things I always say to, to players that are suffering a loss of confidence is, you know why you're feeling like that. You need to write it down, you know, because you, you're the person who knows how you feel about anything. And you, and you know what's caused it. You know, is it because I'm losing ground against some of my peer group? I used to be able to beat them and I can't now. Is it that? Is it that somebody's putting pressure on you to win um, or to play and you don't want to or you're struggling with, the, with that side of it? Um, and I think, you know, if you're, if you're a young player, especially if you're in your teens, that is so normal. It's so normal to doubt yourself and worry about how you look how people see you, what people think of you. It's so normal and it will pass a bit. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, if you can write something down and see if you, if, you can, if you can write down where it came from, because if you know what's caused it, it's easier to find a way to create a solution for it. But, you know, find somebody who you can talk to about it. And I, I know when I was young, which was a very, very long time ago, I always found my mum's best friend I could always talk to her in a way that I couldn't talk to my mom. And we didn't have coaches and things in, in those days. But if we, if we had, I had a really great PE teacher at school, a, a woman who used to take me on weekends sometimes to tennis things because she, she liked it. She made opportunities. I found her really easy to talk to because she was a bit removed, but she understood sport. And my mom's friend, she kind of understood me as a person, even if she doesn't understand the sporty sort of side of things. So find somebody to speak to. Find if you, if you can find somebody who you who you trust, who you feel comfortable with, or somebody who's gone through what you've gone through. Somebody who's maybe come out the other side of it. You know, an older member of your club or your training group or what, whatever. Um, and 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 talk because if you hold everything to yourself, it'll never get better. So find somebody. Um, but if you can't find somebody, write things down. Pros cons. What happened? Why do I feel like this? Who's making me feel like this? And if it's somebody who's making you feel like that, ditch them. Get well away from them. You don't need them in your space. So don't let anybody make you feel bad about yourself. Um, you know, and, and if it's about your level of play, can you speak to your coach about it? What could you do more of? There's loads of things you can learn from watching on TV and live streaming and, you know, listening listening and watching what other people do lots of things that you can do on your on your own as well so find somebody to talk to write things down find find things that you can learn in books and tvs and all the rest of it i hope that i hope that helps i, I find it really difficult to do that when i don't know who i'm talking to but uh, but you're not alone if you're in your teams you're guaranteed nearly everybody else is going through the same thing and it will pass Thank you for that. And a question from Tracy. I have two children and they're in different sports. Uh, one is in tennis and the other one is in golf. But my younger child in golf is showing more potential. And now I have to split my time. How do I talk to my older ones, uh, older one? Oh, that's a difficult one as well. I do. Um, I, 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 do realize that you know with with my kids both going down the tennis route you know, or deciding they were going down the tennis route um it it helped me a lot that they were both boys they were 15 months apart so they were more or less playing in the same things and doing the same thing and i did often wonder what it would be like for me if i'd had 
a son and a daughter because the boys will be playing here and the girls will be playing here or if they were doing something completely different because it's very very difficult to to, to split yourself and be fair to, to both but I think I think what you need to be careful of with with that is that if there is a child showing potential and a child who's doing something quite different or and maybe not showing as much attention potential is that you don't allow one to feel that they're not as important as the other that you have to find a way to ensure that you're spending an equal amount of time encouraging them both to get the best out of themselves and could you with the one who has potential could you find somebody else in your area or your network who is doing the same thing with their child who could help to take some of that travel load or what you know whatever it is off you could you buddy up a bit with that because it is a it is a very difficult thing for the siblings who are left behind to handle because it doesn't matter how hard you try they will feel like they're being overlooked or they, they're being left out and that you're favoring one before the other so see uh, see what you can do to to find others who, who could help you uh manage some of your time with lift sharing or you know whatever it is um but also just not that thing of i'm spending more time because they're good at it it's actually you love your kids whatever they do and one's good at, at something the other one will be great at, at, at you know at something else but i think you have to try to encourage and support as equally as you possibly can and I, I know it's difficult but think out the box a bit and see if you can find others I was so lucky to have my mum and dad you know if my boys were doing something completely different from each other and I couldn't split myself in half or there was only one car my mum and dad were just around the corner and they each had a car I was very lucky they could feed them they could drop them at wherever whatever but equally, you know, there were other parents at the club, chuck four of them in the car and, and do, do a rota. So, yeah, and that's tough, isn't it? And, that, and that's really tough because at the end of the day, you have to be mindful that they're two individuals. The person must come first. It's not what it is that they do well because sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and gravitate more, a little more towards the potential. Yeah, and I think it's very easy as parents to get um, to get flattered by your child being in a certain squad or having a certain label and being one of the cool kids or you know what whatever it is. Um, and it, it's yeah, it, it is. I mean, you love your kids because of who they are, not what they can do. Uh, so it, it is a tricky one. Good luck. Yeah. Um, question from um, Susan, a um, tennis parent. Hello, I don't play tennis, but my my daughter does. Um, when I go to tournament, <laughs> um, I am seen as a very intense mom and around training time, I'm seen as a controlled mother. Should I not go to tournaments? <laughs> oh, gosh. Again, it's another one of those things where you know, I, I don't know you, I don't, I don't know what you're like, but I think one of the things that I would say is that, you know, it's, it's tough for kids to get anywhere in tennis without parents who are committed, uh, you know, to, to helping them. But I, I learned not just from my own kids, but from the many, many kids that I coached and traveled with, uh, who would open up to me about how their parents made them feel uh, in terms of the way they behaved or the way that they spoke or the way that they reacted to a win or a loss um, and it, so I think as parents we have to be very careful how we how we behave how we act when we're watching them playing for example because actually kids pick up on absolutely everything from you and even if you have to put on a bit of a bluff you know a relaxed bluff it, it's it's worth investing in those acting skills <laughs> um, because you, you, don't, you want the kids to enjoy it for the long haul. And if they start to feel a pressure because they perceive that you're not enjoying it or you're disappointed that they... I mean, I couldn't tell you the number of kids that I've, that I've traveled with who would say to me, oh, my mom, you know, I lost my serve and I went four one down in the first set and she walked out or I double faulted twice in a row and she got up and left. They know everything that, that, that's going on. Um, and I think actually this is another reason why I think there needs to be more support for parents 
to help them to understand each stage of the journey, what it's going to demand of you financially, logistically, emotionally, um, how you can best help them. And it, you know, it's a win and loss sport and it's largely individual. So, you know, you're going to probably lose as much as you win, if not, you know, if not more, it depends on the level. But I think it, it's, you know, as parents, we have to understand what the long haul is about, all about it and how asking questions or don't ask anything after they've lost or won. Let them open up the conversation and then just ask questions. Don't force your opinion on it. I, I kind of learned to get quite good at that. Just wait. And everybody's different. Some kids will want to talk about it straight away. Some will sulk for hours. Let them do whatever is right for them. And when they come to you, just ask the question. Well, if you play, if you play with him again, what, what would you do differently? And well, what do you think you need to practice? What can we help you with? You know, let them know that you are there to help uh, in some way. And uh, you know, I think things like taking them to the supermarket and making them pick their own snacks, making them pack their own bag. So if you think you're a control freak, think about what everything that you might be controlling that they could take some control of. And the, the learning how to use the washing machine and learning how to go to the shops and pick your own, your own snacks or your own whatever to take the to. These are just little simple things that remove some of the control and make them realize this is your sport. You choose, you decide and not feeling that it's all up to the parent to make everything absolutely right. Because that's what we do, it's called the writing reflex and we want things to go right for our kids. And nowadays, parents totally overprotect and do, and do much more than maybe in my era, parents ever would, just because the, work, the world is different. But the tennis journey will demand that kids have to think for themselves, be responsible, be independent, further, further down the line, don't know how old your child is. How can you best help them to learn those skills without doing it yourself. Well, Judy, the hour has come <laughs> way too fast. Thank you so much. Thank you again for giving us your time and invaluable insights. I wish you safety and on behalf of the audience, have a great week and be safe. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. I know I talk far too much, but Hopefully some of it made a bit of sense, gave you some, some ideas, but good luck on your tennis journey with your, with your kids. Have a great day. <laughs> All right, everybody. That is the conclusion of having Judy sharing her insights on her um, tennis journey with us. Um, I, lots to take away from that. There will be a recording in a day or two on my website, patriciahe.com, if you would like to revisit. Um, all the recordings are there. So it has taken me a lot of effort and, of course, the courtesy of the great athletes and coaches, tarin, uh, tennis parent coaches, to come share their time with us. It is with that in mind that we have to come together and our kids, uh, we're all trying to pro provide the best opportunities for our kids to excel. So we will continue with this journey and I will do my very bestest to um, continue with the weekly coaching webinar. Should you wish to reach me, um, I'm on Instagram, uh, uh, Patricia He underscore after my last name. I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, our next guest, uh, what I love most about the uh, weekly webinar is actually the emails and feedback that I get from you. Uh, I love to read every one of them. And yes, I do read every one of them. And one of the requests was that you would like to hear of experiences from the college players. So one week from now, next Sunday, we will be having two awesome college players with us. One is a freshly graduate um, female player on the Ohio State University. And the other one is a local great hero, national champion titles, um, Ryan Navarro, who is going to George Washington, finishing, just finished his second year. So please save the date. It will be on a Sunday next week and I will send out, uh, we're looking, I am 
um, if you've noticed, I've moved the webinar to today, Sunday, because I really want the audience to be able to log on. It's beautiful up, clubs, clubs are opening up. So I'm sure everybody is looking forward to go outside and go back into tennis. So Saturdays, I don't want to take that away from you, but Sunday morning at nine o'clock, you can make it. So I will see you on Sunday. Have a safe, happy Sunday.